Hey guys, we're out and about and I thought this is a good time to do another episode of Stalking Shadows. So we finished up the last one when Mike and his dad had just come out and experienced the trip with myself again. It was the second time hunting with me and we finished off a cracker of a safaris. And he got home and had got in contact with two gentlemen by the name of Bill and Billy Crawford and they were keen to come out on a safari with myself. So they contacted us with a few species. I'm tripping over my words here now. And we got the list that was a uh, games pack. They each wanted to shoot a kudu, each wanted to shoot a war dog, um, blue wildebeest, red hartebeest. And that was kind of the run of the mill species that we had to go after. So the guys booked their tickets first time out. They did all their tickets and everything themselves and gave me their dates. And I remember getting to the airport. This trip again, I had my brother out helping me. But this time, I got a friend of mine to do the catering, Nikki. And she did an excellent job, fed us really well. But this time around, Ryan really got to enjoy um, hunting and not having to stress about cooking some meals. So he spent a few days out in the bush with us. So the guys arrived and they it was awesome they arrived in in about the end of may june it was still the rut was still in and we set up at our beach accommodation guys um and we had had some crazy rain just before the guys had come out which was also unseasonal but it was awesome having the rain and we started our our hunt here on on our property where our trackers were staying obviously the house hadn't been set up so we were all based at the at the beach house and we we traveled up every day grab the trackers from here and then head out go hunt and so on and so forth so this trip wasn't a long trip it was only seven days it was a short short stay so we grabbed the trackers here and we headed out the first day for blue wildebeest we went to a buddy's place and bill billy was after the blue wildebeest and ryan was there and he actually had a an old tape cam record thing we were going to video as much of my hunt as possible try and do all this stuff that everyone does <laughs> all the time now and we managed to find the blue wildebeest it was i remember it was a terribly windy day both guys came out with 270 win mags um, and they chose to hunt with Remington core lock bullets. So I'm telling you guys this now because at the time with the, the ammo, I wasn't too sure how it performed, but I shot 270. Any 130 grain, 150 grain bullet worked extremely well for me. So now we're starting the hunt and I've never had a client shoot with those Remington core locks before. And we found the blue wildebeest lying down in the sun. It's winter's morning, it's cold. And we managed to put a crack of a stalk on him. And I get Bill set up and this pool's not getting up. This pool's not getting up. So we stand around, stand around. Eventually I said to, said to Billy, I said, man, if you're feeling comfortable, Aim middle of the shoulder. It's about 200 yards across here. And thump him. We'll get him where he's sleeping. So Billy fires a shot. He smokes the pool. And it falls over. It doesn't get up. So in the video, you'll still see my brother pan on to, to Billy and go, Billy, what's it like shooting your first South African animal? And we all super stoked about this animal just rolling over. Next minute, the tracker goes, hey, it's getting up. And as he turned like that, I said, oh, shucks, Billy, there, it's up. Got him back on the sticks again. Billy smoked it a second time. He smoked it a third time. And this thing took off. So I was like, well, that is a great way to start a safari. You have this excitement, a boom. It's dead. Congratulations. Up and it's gone. <laughs> so we end up getting down there where it was. So there's this big field and there's ran into the thick valley we managed to to track it 
and we followed the blood, followed the blood, and then we found him bedded down, and he jumped up, and Billy put another shot in him, and down he went. So we got the pictures of the bull, we got him out there, it was a bit of a tricky retrieval now, because animal hadn't gone and died where we originally shot him, so it took a bit of time, got him out, got to the skinning shed, we caped him off, and off we went, we carried on with the rest of our hunt. So with that, we finished up the day looking for warthog and stuff on our property. We didn't find what we were looking for. There was a specific big boar that I was after. So we decided on, on heading out to go after Kudu, Gemspuck and Red Hardebeast. I had a property where I shot these the really big Red Hardebeast that I was telling you about. I had Gemspuck available to me there and we had... Um, really really nice kudu available so we head out that morning ryan's still with us he joined us for a few days as i said and we start with the red hearted beast and we find a beaut of a red hearted beast for for bill and i'm going to tell you bill bill was a true champion this hunt if i'm not mistaken he was in his 70s and the man walked and stalked he wore his jeans and his cowboy boots and he hunted a full safari in his cowboy boots so we and 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 he's i kept saying to him well your feet not getting sore he says no but a good worn boot is a comfortable boot so we had a, a an awesome hunt together really great guys and we got him set up on his red hearted beast set it all up squeezed the shot off perfect shot red hearted beast did it 50 yard dash and then fell into a pile of dirt so we got some pictures there it's a great picture of like my brother and i with pill and billy a really beautiful red hearted beast and that is how our day was going on then we hunted hard for kudu and we didn't see any kudu or saw we didn't we didn't see any kudu worth shooting at that time so it was only like day two but we headed on back and we decided the next day we would go back for um, our Gemspuck and Kudu and everything like that. So we went back that day to the same property. We traveled there backwards and forwards a few times because we were after the specific animals that that property catered for us. And we hunted extremely hard. I remember we spotted a lone gemspuck bull way back in the furthest corner of this property where there are no roads and guys the gemspuck that are here in the eastern cape a lot of people don't know obviously they're introduced so you don't shoot those gemspuck bulls of 40 plus inches like they do in namibia it's the same as our kudu yeah you know in namibia you shoot 60 inch bulls yeah we shoot 15 inch bulls that's like Massive, massive. There's a difference. Same with the Kalahari springbuck to the springbuck in the Eastern Cape. For some, it's the same species as, as the same species. But I think it's got a lot to do with the vegetation that the animals live and eat off of, which makes a, a distinct size difference in the in the horns or your your size of trophy. So we spotted this Gemspark bull. A really old bull, but he didn't have very long pegs on him. And I said to Billy, I said, there he's coming down the mountain, but he'd spotted us and he was running. So Billy got set up and it was a poke. It was 300, I want to say 380, 350. But luckily he was coming down towards us. And he was getting a little closer every time. But when he fired his first shot at the bull, the bull was probably 380-odd meters we like and we were standing in the open there was no way for us to gain ground on him we we're shooting across a valley and billy pulled off a cracker of a shot and smoked this thing and he fell there into what we call speck worm um called elephant plant it's a type of like i want to say like desert plant it's got hasn't got thorns on it but a very watery leaf and it's very, very good for the environment. It takes up, that plant takes up like 90% of our carbon dioxide. So it's an 
awesome plant to have on your property. So I landed there and we went across and we got some pictures, but now it's just myself and the tracker. My brother's not there, so the two of us lift this gems pack up and we carry it out. So we finish our day off getting getting the gems pack and head back home. The next day we decide to have a bit of a quieter day instead of getting up so early and heading on to go and hunt on that property again because now we're after kudu we had the kudu left in the bag and then the warthogs we went out on our property and we hunted hard for warthogs and the whole morning we didn't see anything we went back for lunch we came back that afternoon i spot a bus of a pig a absolute beauty one of the biggest pigs i've seen on our property and billy got all set up and he made the most perfect shot on this pig down it went we got there fetched one of my other guys from the property to help carry out and we carried out this absolute baby hippo of a pig beautiful warthog trophy that billy got and that was how we ended up ended our day so we had two days left of our safari and now we had to get really into hunting kudu and we headed on out to the property that we've been hunting the red heart beast and stuff on i'll never forget we went and looked in one of the spots where the river dry river bed and it was like a, a ledge that you could stand on and look down and with that i spot the most magnificent kudu bull i've seen in a long time and we make a beautiful stalk on him i get bill set up because it's his turn now and bill thumps the kudu bull and the kudu bull goes down under the trees and we head down and while we're walking down to get to the kudu i hear this funny raspy noise which I've never heard before. And it was like an absolute, like, funny goggle, bellow type noise. And I thought, okay. And as we popped out the bush where the kudubu was lying, the damn thing jumped up and took off. With that, Bill fired a few more shots. I got the dogs, put the two dogs on it, but there was such a small amount of blood and we couldn't understand what had actually happened here the kudubu fell beautifully in his tracks we get there this bull makes a noise and it bolts the dogs chased that bull for hours but this bull wasn't slowing up and we couldn't understand there's no broken bones there's no why is this bull thing now going through my mind i think the guys sh shot him high in the spine um, and just like stunned him and he fell down but I said, this noise kept sitting in the back of my head and I couldn't get it out. And I was like, I've never seen that before. With that, we spotted another bull and I got Billy to shoot the bull. Billy shoots his bull, his bull goes down. Next minute, his bull jumps up and I'm going, what the heck is going on? So he managed to put another shot in him. We put the dogs on him now. Now there's a bit more blood. And with that, the dogs bumped him up and the bull comes running past Billy and he does a full free hand swing and he smokes his bull and it rolls down. We get up to the bull and the bull's still not dead, so Billy shoots it again. And I'm going, what the heck is going on? Why are these kudu just with a perfect shot just taking off? Anyway, we, we managed to get some photos of Billy's bull. We get it all loaded up and... We head out to the property and we go to the landowner and I explain to the landowner what happened. You know, please, you must just keep an eye. That's a, a magnificent kudu bull, really, really big kudu bull. Um, please just keep an eye out for him. If you find him, let me know so I can come at least retrieve the horns and the skull for um, Bill. I'm sure the bull's not going to survive. And off we went and the tracker started skinning this bull. And we were finding the bullets were not performing. Billy had shot his bull in the neck when it came running past him, which knocked it over. But the bullet had absolutely disintegrated. 
His first shot where he shot him behind the shoulder had only penetrated just into the chest cavity. So the bullets were not performing or gaining enough penetration on them to make a, a, a decent enough kill. And this is what we kind of like had figured out now why we hadn't found any blood on Bill's kudu because it was a few little drops of blood. There was no pass through. And I'm a firm, firm believer that your bullet must pass through. If your bullet passes through, you follow a blood trail on the left side and the right side of an animal while it's bleeding, especially when it starts running up and down hills. You know, for that blood pressure to come up, it's got to pump it out. But if it's only gone in, you don't have a decent enough track because it's got to bleed out the entrance hole, which is extremely small. Your exit's normally big. So when they bleed internally, it all is internal and you kind of, you, you struggle with your tracking. So we head back, a little bit of a somber, you know, evening because now you've, you've lost a bull and there's no ways we can go back the next day and track the bull. The only other option is I offered to to Bill, I've got another property closer. It's our last day of hunting, which kind of gives us a bit of the morning and a bit of the afternoon. And then we've got to obviously finalize all our paperwork and get all our animals to the taxidermist. So with that, we head to my buddy and he says, no, he's got a bull on quota for me. Let's go and have a look. So we head out, we spot a bull, we do a stalk. Yes, and we can't get on these bulls and we can't get on these bulls. And we hunt extremely hard. That we actually hunt right until the sun starts setting. And oh, before I <laughs> tell you this, this part, this last day of hunting, I'm hunting by myself, no tracker. Why? Because my tracker, when not on our drive home from our kudu, tells me it's a it's a tracker. It's not my own personal tracker. It's a tracker that I've had to use because I told you previously my tracker had left. So I'd hired another guy. And no, he had to be in court the next day. So he couldn't be at, you know, at the last day. So I dumped him off in town so he can go to his court, his court case and whoever, who knows what it was for. But the last day we are hunting on solely on our own. So we spot now a beautiful Nyala bull as the sun's setting. And I said to, said to um, Bill, I said, Bill, that is an exceptional, exceptional Nyala bull. They don't get much better than that. You know, look, I'll make you a deal. Let's shoot that. Don't ever pass it up. You never know if you're coming back to Africa again or not. And don't pass up something that is exceptional. Like, I was super excited about it. It's one of those once-in-a-lifetime type bulls. And he decided, no, he's going to shoot it. And he made a crack of a shot and got... A beautiful, beautiful Nyala bull in the dying light of the last day. So with this, <coughs> um, my buddy, where I hunted there, there I got to keep the meat. Where a lot of other farmers, where you shoot, you leave the meat behind and you take the trophy. So with him, I, the, the trophy was mine. But now I'm sitting with no tracker and skinner here. And... I had nowhere to hang it. So I quickly phoned the taxidermist. I said, listen, I'm bringing you a whole animal. Have you got space in your cool room for me? And can your guy skin it off? It's, I'm going to be probably there in three to four hours time. So because I'm like miles away, I'm going to head back. I'm going to drop the clients off. Let them have showers and dinners and everything, their last dinners. And then I'm going to rush through to you, which is 100 kilometers away and come and drop this trophy off with you and then rush all the way back so we did that i dropped it off with the taxidermist i said i'll bring you the rest of the trophies tomorrow or the next day i need to get the clients back back to the airport the next morning for their flight home so we finished up a beautiful evening lovely big steaks around the fire true south african pra nikki had made a feast for us there for the last for the last day Got all the paperwork squared away. And the next morning, Bill and Billy were in the pickup and we were on our way to Port Elizabeth Airport to get the guys dropped off. And we walk into the airport, we get to the front desk and the guys want to check their bags and their rifles in. And guess what? 
the air hostess or the lady there at the counter says, um, excuse me, sir, we do not fly with firearms. I'm like, holy smokes. So what happened was Bill and Billy flew all the way to South Africa with SAA, which they are, have carriers for firearms and stuff. And when they booked their return ticket, they changed the one little domestic flight here from Port Elizabeth to Joburg to British Airways. And British Airways had just stopped flying with weapons then. Prior to that, they'd been flying with them. They had stopped the courier service for weapons. Now the two guys are sitting here and they need to get to Joburg and they can't fly with their weapons. So the only option we had was we ended up at the counter at SAA to try and get them on a flight to get them to Port to get them to Joburg soon enough so they can get their connecting flight back home from Johannesburg. So we get to the counter and the guys purchase their tickets and Billy sw swipes his card and the banks decline it because now all of a sudden they think there's some fraud happening on this side because the banks didn't recognize where the payment was coming from. Either the bank wasn't informed that he was going to use his card here in South Africa and it declined it. So I stood there and I said to the guys, don't worry, bud, I'll pay for the tickets. So I paid for their two tickets. We got them all on the plane and we managed to get them home. <clears throat> Bill and Billy, super appreciative of everything that I did for them. And they sorted me out when they landed back in the States and I got my bucks back. So that's just a little thing for, for, for outfitters and stuff. Just make sure when your clients book, that they're booking with the correct airline that flies with weapons. Make sure the domestic flights and the international flights have got a handling service with firearms. Otherwise, you'll be in the same position as poor Bill and Billy on their way home after a great safari and getting there, and all of a sudden, they can't fly with their rifles. So that was a crack of a hand, and it was a lot of learning curves again for me hosting my first international client. And it went off extremely well, and what... I think finished it off even better was two to three days later after Bill and Billy landed back in the States, I got a phone call from the farmer and they had found Billy's, no, Bill's Kudubu. And unfortunately, we never found him, but it was crazy how the Kudubu had made his way and on his loop back to where we'd hunted him, which was obviously his area where he was living. He passed away from his injuries single bullet hole in the neck and what had happened that bullet had gone in never penetrated properly the bullet bled internally and then died like that and we couldn't track him because we had no blood to follow an absolute beaut of a 53 inch kudu bull in the eastern cape so yeah sadly he didn't have any photos with his bull but what i did was i got the taxidermist to um organized him a cape and we got the kudubu mounted for him and shipped over so he had a red order beast a nyala bull and a kudubu and billy his son had a kudubu a gemspuck a blue wildebeest and a beautiful big war dog so what a cracking way to end off a safari so guys if you're enjoying these please hit the like and subscribe button it goes a long way to keep the channel rolling and we'll catch you in the next one Cheers.